from the campus of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Consider this, a program of issues and information behind today's news. It's not that it can't be done, and I, I just am not sure that I want to do that anymore. On paper, current retirement numbers in OPS are actually below average. At the end of the school year, 85 teachers will retire. That's on top of the 88 that stepped down the year before. But with fewer new teachers signing on, keeping seasoned educators like BOMA is crucial. It's something that every district across the nation, from small town Nebraska to New York City, struggles with. And we continue to work with that and, and try to help grow our own teachers and support teachers in their own growth so that we can combat that lower candidate pool for new teaching positions. Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Wyatt. Welcome to this week's edition of Consider This. Our topic, teaching in Nebraska. Joining us to talk more about it are Matthew Bloomstead, Nebraska Education Commissioner. Dr. Susan Sheridan, Associate Dean for Research and Creative Activity, Director for Nebraska Center for Research on Children, Youth, Families, and Schools, and George Holmes University Professor School Psychology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And finally, Paul Tim. Paul is a science instructor at Lions Decatur Northeast. He is also 2021 Nebraska Teacher of the Year. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome. Thanks, Kathy. Commissioner, I wanna start with you. Uh, let's set the stage a little bit. Talk about what you're anticipating in terms of enrollment across the state for this upcoming year. Yeah, from a K-12 perspective, we typically have over 300,000 students in our in our public schools. Actually about another 20,000 in our pre-K settings as well. And so uh, we've really seen that actually grow over the last few years and, and continue to see that. I think last year there was a lot of concern about how many students were you know, perhaps uh, choosing homeschool or otherwise, but that's actually a very small percentage of the overall and so yeah I would expect around 310,000 students in K-12. Okay now having said that what kind of a staff does it take to support what you've just shared? Yeah obviously statewide I mean we're about 24,000 teachers that need to be employed we have uh, many thousands of paraeducators uh, bus drivers, custodial staff, all of that really makes up that school setting. And so balancing that's really important. Obviously at a school level, we're really worried um, that we would have always very well prepared and supported teachers in our, in our schools. But from an elementary perspective, from a middle school perspective, and from a high school perspective, um, we, have, we have a lot of dedicated teachers and that's what we always hope for in our school settings. As you are going into this year, uh, understanding there is a shortage what is it that you are hopefully but losing sleep over at night, Commissioner? Yeah, a, a big one really for us in the pandemic has been as we were impacted last year, there was a real need for substitute teachers and others to be available, just almost hands on deck sometimes. And, and so we really tried to provide some additional flexibilities during the pandemic. And we'll do that again this school year. But I think in the, the longer haul of this, we've seen a teacher shortage kind of building over time. And I think it's really important for us to be recruiting teachers into the profession. It's really the, one of the greatest professions in the, in the world, quite frankly, there's not more you could do to really feel connected with your school, with your community, with your students, with families in a community, and it's a real public service, as well as just a rewarding profession overall. What a great way to open this program. I really appreciate that. And we're gonna get back to some of what you have said here. I wanna go to Susan, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about those whys. But before we do that, can you share a little bit about your background? For sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I am not a native Nebraskan, but I've been here for 23 years and I chose Nebraska very carefully and thoughtfully because I wanted to raise my own children here. And I do believe that Nebraska is the best place to raise a child. And so I came here um, as uh, a professor at the University of Nebraska, having served as a school psychologist prior to going back um, to school and, and getting an advanced degree. Because I agree with Matt that um, education in general is the best profession and the best way to serve children, families, and communities is to really help educate and ensure that the next generation is as well prepared and um, as capable of giving back as they can possibly be. So I started as a school psychologist and I decided, you know, it's really possible to have broader impact um, by 
by entering the academia and, and being able to train the next generation of educators. So I've been at Nebraska for 23 years. I'm now directing the Nebraska Center for Research on Children, Youth, Families, and Schools in the College of Education and Human Sciences because that's where it's happening. That's where it's really happening. Okay, and like so many professions, this too has changed um, in terms of the whole educational realm. Talk to us a little bit about the evolution of maybe life in the classroom, as especially as you've seen it over the years. And I, and I have to say it's life in the school, not just the classroom. The, the whole context of education has changed significantly in the time that I've been an educator. Uh, it certainly used to be the case that you could go into your classroom and close the door and do your own business and maybe get out at lunchtime and socialize a little bit in the teacher's lounge and then go back and if you had a concern about a student you might refer that student to some specialist who wore a you know, sort of expert cap and they did their thing um, and then they wrote their report and then they went back to their office. That's not the case anymore. People are in a, in a very vibrant and exciting way working together and collaborating and supporting one another because that's the nature of education. Those are the contexts where children learn best. So there's a lot more uh, dynamic interplay among educators, among specialists. And I'll tell you, there's also a lot more recognition about the role that families play and the importance of partnering with families as co-leaders, as co-teachers, as co-supporters of children who share the goal and share the responsibility of ensuring that our children and the next generation of leaders is prepared to the best capacity that they can. Yeah, and doing as, as well as they possibly can, um, obviously. And, and I guess that brings us to 2019, and I really want to point out to our viewers, this was pre-pandemic, okay. but there are always surveys being done, right, Susan? I know you're behind the scenes on so many of them. Um, in 2019, there was a teacher shortage survey conducted, which really was kind of starting to show what was happening even pre-pandemic. We're gonna, I'm gonna put a graphic up for our viewers. Okay. If you could tell us what we're seeing there sure, in terms sure. of that yeah. um, survey or study. Yeah, and let me back it up just a half a step and provide some context here. You are correct, Kathy, that um, there is a survey conducted every single year, in fact, by the Nebraska Department of Education that assesses the workforce, essentially, the, the education workforce in the state of Nebraska. And it's particularly concerned with identifying the shortage areas. And it's not just teachers in the classroom. Certainly that's a big concern that we have and we've had for many years, as Matt pointed out. Um, but it's all endorsement areas. So, and it takes a village to educate a child. And it's, it's the classroom teacher, but it's also the special educator and the, and the uh, speech and language pathologist and the specialist in language arts and, and science and, and other disciplines. And what, what we have found consistently in the state of Nebraska is that there are significant shortage areas in a number of, of these endorsement areas, um, but the largest one is special education. It's really a challenge to get certified, endorsed, at special, educate, special educators mm -hmm. in the classroom dealing with some of our most vulnerable children. Other shortage areas are language arts, math, science, and also areas like school counseling and school psychology. Again, all of these support staff that really um, comprise the, the fabric of a school and, and together hold up uh, the educational system. Um, what's interesting and important, I think, to point out is that these same areas have been consistent shortages for the last five years in all cases and in some cases for the last 15 years we're seeing persistent and consistent shortages in these endorsement areas and the vacancies are now filled some remain vacant for the entire school year and if that isn't somewhat troubling enough especially for those of you who work in this every single day enter the pandemic, mm -hmm. right, which complicates things even further, which the commissioner alluded to just a little bit earlier. We have another graphic that we want to put up because this really has, I, I don't know that even I have stopped to really think about the impact that this pandemic has had on the educators, yes. you know. Um, and so let's put that up and, and talk to us about that, okay. Susan. Okay, sure. Um, we did a survey in collaboration with the Nebraska Department of Education in 2020, in the spring of 2020. So it was at the tail end of that year when schools closed and 
all of our students across the state of Nebraska were not filling classrooms and teachers were 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 pivoting and they were punting in some ways um, to ensure that they were providing still the best highest quality educational experience that they could in this very uncertain time and uh, we surveyed every teacher every principal and every superintendent in the state of Nebraska and we got a very high response rate so again we believe that like the teacher shortage, shortage surveys um, particularly that same year 2019 we have a very representative sample of what teachers are telling us about that experience and they told us a lot of things that were very important one thing they told us was that they were very concerned about the students who they lost track of there were a percentage of students who we didn't really know exactly where they were during that time. Um, we weren't able to connect with families in the ways that we want to as educators. And uh, they were most concerned about these students with special needs who required individualized supports and individualized services that they just were not able to provide. Or they were providing in very creative ways. I will say our teachers did a phenomenal job in rising to the occasion, um, but it was at somewhat of a cost. And the graphic that you saw just a minute ago illustrated the high levels of stress that our teachers, mm -hmm. principals, and superintendents all reported during this time. They were concerned about their students' mental health for sure. They were concerned about their learning. They also told us they were very concerned about their students' mental health because they were isolated, they mm -hmm. were alone, many you know, were fending for themselves while parents were trying to do what they needed to do to support their families. Um, but the teachers' mental health also, two-thirds of our teachers and 90% of our principals and superintendents told us that they, were, that they were moderately to extremely highly stressed under this time. And um, that trickles into you know, their own well-being, their own per physical health and their ability to sort of separate home and school life and, and all kinds of things that um, you know, we all need to, to take care of ourselves and then to perform to the best of our ability for our students. So it was a very challenging time. And um, like I said, I think our educators really rose to the occasion. It is one of the most rewarding jobs in the world. It's also one of the most challenging jobs in the best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm just really proud of, of how we all did. You're getting a lot of nods from this gentleman to the right of you. Um, Paul, before we talk about just the amazing um, award and, and your efforts uh, this past year, I want to go back in time. And I want to ask, when did you first know you wanted to be a teacher? Oh, you know, uh, your teenage years are interesting, right? Because your, your whims and the things that you're interested in, uh, interested in can change so quickly. Um, but I remember distinctly between that summer of my junior and senior year, uh, my agricultural education instructor, Myron Schock, took me to a leadership conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, and during that four-day leadership conference, I just started reflecting back upon um, what his involvement in my life and other teachers' involvement in my life and my coaches had meant to me. Uh, and, and being in your nation's capital, you can't but think about uh, what is the role that I am going to play in this grand, beautiful country that's been created for me by so many people before me? Uh, and it just, it, I decided that last night I was there. I'm, I'm going to become a teacher. Um, as to what teacher, uh, what I was going to teach, I, I suffer from being interested in everything. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I started my journey at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, getting striving to get dual endorsements both in ag education as well as high school biology. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's where my, my road to becoming a teacher started uh, and I've just continued to, to learn ever since. I've added another endorsement in health sciences uh, and have added a, a bus driver's license uh, and multiple other hats and sponsor several things. So it's, it's been a joy. Oh my goodness. Okay, so first school, where were you? Where did you get started? Uh, I got started at Laurel Concord Public Schools back in 2003. Taught there for five years, agricultural education. I uh, was also the FFA advisor, and uh, in my second year, was asked if I'd be interested in coaching cross country. Um, had never coached nor run a race in my <laughs> life. Uh, was a high school uh, offensive lineman, if you can believe that. Uh, but 
while in college discovered the habit of running and really enjoyed it and my superintendent saw I was doing that and they they needed a coach uh, and so that started my my passion and love with coaching uh, coached four years there uh, and then an opening occurred in Lyons Nebraska which is actually my high school alma mater I graduated from Lyons Decatur Northeast Public Schools in Lyons Nebraska uh, and so uh, a position opened uh, my wife and I we decided let's apply and see how this goes because I met my wife in my my first year of teaching she's a speech language pathologist by trade uh, and so um, we've been blessed by living within the educational community our whole lives um, our, my family is either educators or they're involved in the healthcare system um, my, my stepmother my mother my dad trained as a teacher prior to going back to farm um, after a family tragedy um, and, and my stepsister is a, is a teacher in uh, OPS she's now a guidance counselor um, I want to make sure I don't forget anyone but we're, we're just a family that education has um, we value it not only for what it does in our lives and our families lives but um, the joy in the community that is within that um, you alluded alluded to the fact that you know it, the the job of education is not just delivery of content um, and and that's where both the science and the art of it come together and and when you're doing that within a dynamic dynamic system where you're interacting with other teachers within other disciplines at other grade levels and those kids get to interact uh, amazing things happen I mean it, it's a picture of what the uh, the community is on a grander scale as you're trying to train these kids up to be actively involved within their families within their communities and so I, I just feel really blessed to be teaching where I teach um, because uh, I, I've been afforded a lot of neat opportunities to get to know children and their families uh, and then see them move on and, and some of them uh, stay connected with you know you always wonder about some of those kids like I wonder where he's at or I wonder where she's at but occasionally um, you'll get one of those delightful emails or someone will knock on that door and it's like oh my gosh I remember teaching you welding or I remember <laughs> teaching you about cell respiration uh, and and they'll be able to share about what they're doing in their lives so so you received and now I'm really seeing and understanding how uh, the 2021 Nebraska yes. Teacher of the Year we're gonna put a photograph up what did that mean to get something like that especially in the middle of these unprecedented times talk about that oh my gosh well well it was initially surreal you you apply for such things but you I, I think it's a common trait amongst all teachers to not think more highly of themselves than the others that are around them and so um, there was a, this initial feeling of almost imposter syndrome like um, I'm you know am I really deserving of this um, but then when I realized that um, this is is not necessarily an award but a position in which you get to represent the best though you may not consider yourself to be one of the best um, I think that's really a great way of framing up what Nebraska teacher of the year is and so I, I felt honored um, but I also felt the sense of positionally um, I have a, a, a position now in which um, platform objectives or things that I feel are important within education and important to kids um, or important to teachers I, 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 I'm somewhat of a spokesman for them and so there's a responsibility that comes along with it that um, I'm both humbled by as well as um, I, I enjoy the opportunity to be able to hear people's stories um, when they share about the challenges as well as the joys that they go through because um, it's a fantastic profession but it also comes with its weeds in the field and challenges that go along with it so um, it, it was very humbling once it all kind of finally set in and I saw kind of a vision for um, what the future could be not just this year but even after 2021 gets over um, this this title doesn't disappear um, and so what does that mean as far as um, that kind of civic obligation you have to represent education which I think is, is the best profession out there uh, I love that I'm a part of this so I, I hope that um, I can share that message with people who are considering because uh, I think people that are thinking about becoming teachers also kind of have that feeling well would I do a good job would I be good enough uh, and the truth of the matter is if you care about kids 
and you have something that you're interested in, more than likely you ha there, there's a place for you within public education and we will welcome you with open arms. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I see this whole campaign uh, in the works here. He's speaking and I see him on a billboard and I can't even imagine, in, in all seriousness, being in your position and hearing him not just say what he's saying, but with the passion that is there, obviously. What are you thinking as he's talking? Well, it's really, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, 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 you can see why he's yes. our teacher of the year right now. So, and I also said at the time, when I think when we gave him the award, I'm like, it's also a great time to have a science teacher in that role as well. And so Paul's been a, a, a great uh, person to give us kind of insights about what's working in the classroom, what's not, all those things that come together. But uh, it, it is like this, campaign it's it's one of the I think most amazing uh, professions that you can find yourselves in and some people just find themselves in I think Paul gives a good description of that and so we want to f encourage folks to do that and I, as he was talking about having like former student conversations I was thinking about my 90 some year old uh, former third and fourth grade teacher that called me in the midst of the pandemic and said hey look I'm kind of in isolation doing all this and I think back to all the things that I learned in school from amazing teachers at that point in time and that connection is just a lifetime of, of wisdom that kind of comes together at any moment in time and so that's that's what's so lovely about the teaching profession what what Paul represents I mean what Susan represents too I mean all this coming together is is critical for us and for our future as a country for our future of what happens in the state of Nebraska and then just to think every child gets to enter into a into a, an education system like we have here is, is a remarkable thing and even in the midst of, of uncertainty I, I want to ask if you had all the teachers, and you, you have many of them watching right now, I'm sure, what's the message that you would send to them as we enter into this new year with all the uncertainty uh, regarding the Delta variant and so forth? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think I tweeted this out last year, the top five things that are gonna get us through the year, and last year was teachers, 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 and teachers, and so I had to count, by the way. So the. Uh, uh, you know, again, that's where this, this is where education happens in classrooms and in that partnership that teachers develop with students and in the, the work that they have to connect and, and engage. And, and I'm really proud of what we did last year. We're going to do amazing things yet this year. We have challenges we're going to face. And so it's not going to be easy. I have an advisory group that I've used with teachers. A really stressful time last year just so many different things uh, that were stressful about it in addition to the pandemic I mean just the uncertainty of what would happen the exhaustion um, the worry about the children that are right there in our classrooms right and so we're gonna balance those things out we don't probably have all the answers just like any good teachers not gonna have all the answers they're gonna help discover what those answers are um, we're gonna do that well throughout the the school year um, again just Nebraska figured out a way to do it I was asked around the country with my national college colleagues, you know, how did you get done what you got done? And we had the will, not just from me, not just from, you know, powers that be, so to say, but really from teachers uh, and really from a, a, a desire to be in the classroom serving their students. We, we felt the experience um, without students in classrooms and what that looked like. And I think, you know, pretty much universally, I just heard, let's get back because we know we can manage this in, in an effective way. And, and largely they did that. And, and I got to, you know, thank administrators too that are supporting teachers in those settings are principals or superintendents uh, just really found ways to support their teachers and we'll keep doing that we'll look for ways to do that and I'll keep listening to teachers al along the way as as we manage in the coming year yeah and we are focusing on teachers today but Susan I want to ask you about those parents and kids change is so hard and especially if there is a fear factor mm -hmm. involved in the the uncertainty the unknown mm -hmm. um, for just a minute or two talk to those parents and students sure I'm really glad that Matt mentioned the word partner because that's really what it's about. And I would say to parents, um, you know, teachers are your partner in this, in this whole sort of role of, of, of raising a child and ensuring that they were attending to not only their learning but their overall well-being. Uh, parents are their child's first teacher though and they are their child's best advocate and so the best scenario is one where those come together and we can really form partnerships so reach out to your child's teachers um, ask how you can best support that student in all the other kinds of learning opportunities and experiences that surround a child because yes the classroom is the focus 
for a lot of the academic skill building that happens, but it's only enriched by the kinds of opportunities and experiences that children have, you know, in all those other hours of the day. So a partnership is critical. Collaboration, communication is key. Um, and, and, and to the extent that we can really sort of um, work to find that common ground, um, share the concerns that you have, but do so in a way that's very constructive and proactive and productive so that together you can come to the solutions. Because that's what teachers want too. Teachers want the same things for children that parents want for children. And that's to raise healthy, happy, productive leaders of, of society. Um, and so, you know, we can accomplish that, but we can accomplish it best if we do it together. We have two minutes, Commissioner. I want you to talk to those would-be teachers, those people who are out there watching and thinking, I've always wanted to do that, and Paul's got me all pumped about doing it, and we're gonna get through this pandemic together, and we're gonna keep our kids safe and teach them, and what's the easiest, best route for them to take to find out more about how to become Yeah, one? and they're sure, certainly welcome to go to the Department of Education's website, and we have connections to our certification office that can give you some direction on that really calling any of our educator prep institutions. So at the University of Nebraska, any of those campuses can actually provide you a little direction. Our, our state college, colleges as well. Um, if you reach out to those places, they're gonna say, if you wanna be a teacher, here's where, you know, here's where you're at. You may have a, a degree already. We, can, we have programs that can help folks kind of expedite on that front. And then finally, we have some special programs that help people into the career um, fields that they're interested in. So I, I just encourage folks to reach out. That's very exciting. Okay, Paul, you have about uh, 30 seconds, probably a little more, but I'm going to give you 30. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you the final word in this, this interview today. We're talking about teaching in Nebraska. Talk to our viewers. What would you say? Well, uh, I would challenge those individuals out there that as you think about, uh, is this profession for me, I want you to reflect back on who was that one teacher? Who is the one that is most memorable in a positive way? And chances are that individual wasn't aiming to be your favorite teacher, but they just happened to be at a point in your life doing great things where your heart latched onto them and, and they inspired you. And you in the seats right there have the ability to be that person for the children in our seats today. And so I, I would really encourage you, seek out considering becoming a teacher in Nebraska. Beautifully said. We have a couple websites we wanna put up for our viewers in case they want more information. Paul, thank you so much for that. All right, education.ne.gov or cyfs.unl.edu. I wanna thank all of you for being here today and I wanna wish you so well going into this school year. Best wishes, I'm sure it'll be fine and they've got you at the home so thank you all so much thank you thank, thank you. you and thank you all for watching consider this is an issues and information program produced by UNO television more information and program archives can be found at Nebraska public media dot org slash consider this if you'd like to share your comments about this program call UNO television at 402 554-2516 during regular business hours or send an email to cwyatt at unomaha.edu.